Hello and welcome everyone to this Flaminal Facebook watch party. My name is Alison Schofield and I am a tissue viability clinical nurse specialist. I am really excited to be joining you this evening to talk about leg ulcer assessment. If you haven't seen one of our previous watch parties and I'll just explain to you what it is all about. I have pre-recorded a presentation for you so we can all watch it together and we can then chat about it through the comments. I will be answering your questions and joining you in the conversation throughout the presentation so please don't be shy, ask me any questions you want and no question is ever a silly question. So if you type them in and then um, you know I'll do what I can, if there's anything I'm not sure of I will go away and I will come back to you with that information. I want to thank Flynn Health for putting this event on this evening. Flynn have a number of hygiene tools to give away. So um, if you would find these helpful, you'll be able to find out more about this at the end. So it's definitely worth staying around right through um, to the close of the presentation. Before I start, I just want to let you know that I am going to be doing a follow-up watch party on leg ulcer management in a few weeks' time. So keep an eye on the Flaminal Facebook page for more details. So let's move on to the presentation itself. Now the learning objectives for this evening will be to understand the etiology of leg ulceration, consider all the risk factors involved in developing leg ulcers, Focus on assessment of the lower limb. Show how using an effective holistic assessment approach is for the lower limb. Identify signs and symptoms of venous disease. Understand the role of the Doppler and ABPI in assessment. And we will use the TIMES assessment framework to assess the wound itself. And then create an overview of treatment planning. So the best practice statement definition defines a leg ulcer as an open lesion between the knee and the ankle joint and this occurs in the presence of venous disease and it is a wound that is shows no signs of healing within two weeks. Now that's a change in definition because years ago we always used to say four to six weeks. This is two weeks and then we need to be putting our plans into place. So particularly in patients with a history of venous leg ulcers or venous signs, assessment and treatment should start as soon as we can. So let's just look at the, um, the, the, the circulatory system. So the venous system comprises of, 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 of two types. We have the deep veins, so the femoral, the tibial and the popliteal. So um, running right up the leg there. And then we've got some superficial veins, which are long and short veins. And then linking into all this, we have communicating veins, which are called perforator, and they are smaller veins. So running alongside this, we have the arterial system. So what the arteries do is they deliver oxy oxygenated blood from the heart to those smaller capillaries. And this is through a network of arteries and arterioles. So arterial blood flow can be disrupted if we have a poor pump function. So that blood's not circulating as it should do. There may be an arterial narrowing or an obstruction in the artery and um, atherosclerosis this is known as. There may be an inflammation of the smaller arterioles too. Now adults have around 5 litres of blood and 15% of that is contained in the arteries. A really good quiz question that one. So let's look at the etiologies of leg ulcers. What causes that skin to break down? Well it could be as we've just said there's problems within the arterial circulation. There could be problems within the venous circulation, which are going to, we are going to look at in more detail. It be, could be because the patient has sustained trauma to, to a leg. And this could be um, from any sort of cause, um, from gardening to, um, you know, st stepping onto a bus. I've seen many types of trauma wounds to the lower leg. It could be a pressure ulcer that's occurred. It could also be a malignancy, so we will look at some signs and symptoms of that. There could be an infection that's occurred within the tissues. 
autoimmune condition so if we think of something like lupus this can cause inflammatory responses and skin issues people with rheumatoid arthritis um, this can also cause inflammatory responses and if somebody then sustains trauma it can be difficult um, um, in leg ulceration for that person and there are there are other and complex type of issues too so the risk factors for um, getting a leg ulcer include varicose veins um, and these are often linked with um, with uh, women um, who have gone through pregnancy it's um, that extra pressure that comes onto a vein so this can happen at a relatively young age really in my clinic where we work in North Lincolnshire we actually find there's a lot of men um, with leg ulceration and varicose veins and we don't know whether it's relating to um, you know works um, lifestyle um, but it certainly is, is, isn't just predominantly um, women that we see. Obesity because again this puts extra pressure onto the venous system. The age because as we get older um, the circulatory system, the venous system um, can become affected and not work as effectively as it once did. Also, our skin as we get older loses elasticity and collagen and it can become thinner and drier and more prone to breaks. Reduce mobility because that circulation isn't flowing as it does because when we move we activate um, the, cal the foot pump and the calf pump so we're, um, we're pushing that um, venous blood flow back up to the heart. The environment or social setting, you know, is it a, a somebody in their own home, it's quite cluttered and they're pets. So, you, you know, these, these types of things can cause knocks and breaks to the skin. Smoking, of course, we know um, there's lots of evidence that this, this does affect the arterial system and can cause blocking of the arteries and many other health conditions, co comorbidities, um, such as heart disease, diabetes, for example. So there we have it. There's a, a diagram for you of the circulation system. So we've got the arterial and the venous circulation of the legs with all the different arteries and all the different veins there. So they are interlinking, running alongside each other up and down the body. So keeping the balance is essential. So we have capillary exchange and that's the process that occurs when the oxygen and nutrients are transferred into our surrounding tissues and then this keeps everything healthy. We also have the lymphatic system that is responsible for uh, removing all those waste products within the tissues once we have this process underway with the arterial and um, the venous system. So everything's interlinked. So this diagram that you can see is showing us how normous, normal venous flow works. So we can see there we've got the deep vein, which is in the calf, and then we've got those perforator interlinking veins to the superficial veins. So what happens is, is blood, um, when the calf pump is activated, is pushed up through those veins and then it returns to, um, to get its oxygen and nutrients. And then it's pushed out through the arterial system and it keeps going round the body like that. So within the veins, you can see those darker blue little valves. And what these do is they, when the blood is pumped up, then the valves close and they stop the blood from dropping back down. And that's how a normal venous system um, is working. When we have venous insufficiency, then this diagram shows us the problems. So the valves have become damaged, they're not meeting together, and so we get a backflow of blood. So the blood's pumping up, some of it's getting up to where it should go, but a lot of it is dropping back down and returning. So we get then an overload of, of venous blood supply, it comes 
back through the perforator veins into the superficial veins and then we can see the veins are then becoming baggy the walls are not are, are, are quite thin on these and they just it just can't withstand all that backflow of blood and that's then we start to see the signs and symptoms um, of venous disease and you may see some of those um, quite ropey varicose type veins um, and protruding through um, the skin so venous return is assisted by the foot pump so weight activated um, as the the heel and then that that bottom part the plantar arch of the foot as that touches the ground then the muscles in the foot are squeezed so we have the smaller blood vessels there then the calf muscle contracts and then the um so then the the, the blood flow is pushed up by that calf muscle action so we have to have some ankle movement and people with fixed ankles or problems, they might have had surgery or an injury, sometimes can have um, issues with this. So we have variations in with the intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressure. So we have um, obviously the, the, the venous supply up through the legs and then that comes up through the body. And if somebody's a mobile in bed, by using the action of a profile in bed and putting them into that sitting up position, then that activates that um, the intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressure too. So you can still achieve some element of venous return with that. And if a patient is just sat, um, quite immobile if they just um, you know can wiggle their feet um, if they can flex their ankles that still is activating that foot pump so we will get some venous return with that so we also have the lymphatic system um, and this is running like a road map alongside everything else that's going on in the body so this is a one-way drainage system that returns fluid to the vascular system via a network of lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes so the lymphatic system is such an important role with our immunity and maintaining fluid balance in the body. So the lymph fluid contains fluid, fats, proteins, all the waste products that are carried from the tissues to the lymph nodes. So like the veins, the lymphatic system contains valves and it prevents that backflow of, of fluid um, and then the, the lymph is moved around the system aided by the muscle contraction. So it's all working together. So we can get lymphovenous disease as a result of that venous hypertension from the diagrams we've just looked at because the lymphatic system also becomes overwhelmed with the volume of fluid. And then this is when we start to see edema or swelling in the legs and feet occurring. So this further compounds the impact of that venous disease and if we don't treat um, edema early enough then it can lead on to a chronic edema and we'll look at some of the signs and symptoms of how that can appear too. So one condition is lipodermatosclerosis. So this is when that um, edema hasn't been controlled and it's gone on to develop so we've got a chronicity so the damage valves are compromised in the, the venous return and then that blood because remember it's going back through the perforator veins into the superficial veins where is it going to go so we we often see then signs on the outer skin so we have varicosities and we might call it ankle flare so we might see varicose veins thread veins but then those superficial veins which appear all around that ankle area also a congestion can lead to the leakage of um, red blood cells and then this spills out into the tissues and we get that discoloration of skin so we call it brown staining you can see on the picture there um, it's actually called hemosiderin staining it can also sometimes appear as as, as red um, and inflammation and this is known as red leg syndrome the leg can then become quite woody in appearance and it, it because the tissue has become so fibrosis and you can actually feel it um, and the leg feels quite stiff um, and then we can get that inverted champagne bottle um, leg um, shape occurring 
Another sign of venous disease also is hyperkeratosis. So this is just an overproduction of, of, of the keratin um, on, of skin. So again, untreated without a skincare um, regime, it can become very, very thick and form very thick, hard skin plaques, which are then prone to cracking, breaking, infection, especially fungal infections. Varicose eczema and dermatitis sometimes people can experience too. So this is when the skin becomes very dry and flaky, it's easily damaged and then it, become, it becomes very itchy like eczema and dermatitis can be. Um, and then scratching obviously exacerbates it and we get breaks to the skin. So we need to treat this with lotions and ointments which are common. We have those on our formularies um, and, um, and, and also if it becomes um, extreme and weeping, it might be that we need to look at steroid type treatments. So within our limb assessment, we're going to do that visual assessment. So we need to look at the skin condition and then we're going to examine the shape of the legs. So you can see on those two pictures there, we've got um, the top picture where we've got very um, edematous legs. We've got, um, we've got um, skin staining, we've got the redness to both legs um, and we've even got edema in the dorsum, and the top of the foot and some in the toes there too. And then the bottom picture is an advanced lipodermatosclerosis where we have got that true fibrosis and that inverted champagne bottle leg. So if we measure the legs and then be prior to um, going on to our treatment and management plan, we can, we can see um, the reduction that's occurred. We also want to um, assess the limb temperature through touch. Um, so we're looking at the colour. Is there any signs? That, is there is any heat? Is there signs of cellulitis or is it red leg syndrome? Now, red leg syndrome is, is usually usually bilateral legs, um, one leg with red heat pain, all those clinical signs of infection, maybe cellulitis, um, but we need to get that assessment right because we don't want to be over prescribing of antibiotics. Red leg syndrome is an inflammatory response within venous disease. So we need to do a full holistic um, assessment. Um, so that general patient assessment, um, which is all important. So we're looking and, and we're looking at um, past medical history and medications, etc. All those things, and a lot of us will use wound care lower limb templates. And um, so we will have this on there identified to prompt us um, what to what to assess with. So the leg ulcer assessment includes the Doppler to determine the ABPI status, so ankle brachial pressure index. Now the Doppler is ruling out arterial disease. It doesn't tell us if the patient's got venous disease, it is ruling out arterial disease and then it will inform us what type of compression um, we can apply to aid in the, the patient's healing. The wound and skin assessment and then the classification of what the leg ulcer actually is. So a general assessment checklist is looking at, is a, is a person um, um, overweight? Is there obesity? Because this increases that hydrostatic pressure in the veins of the lower limb and ab abdomen. And do we need to be talking about lifestyle um, type health uh, promotion plans? Is there issues with the mobility or walking? We've already ascertained how the calf pump and the venous return works. So this will compromise the activation of the calf muscle pump. Has there been any previous DVT, deep vein thrombosis, any blood clots deep in that venous system, which can then damage the valves in the veins? And so this will affect that venous return. Is there any family history of VLUs? It is um, quite common and um, running within, um, within families. Does the patient have any history of intravenous drug use? Because this can also damage, cause damage to um, the venous system. Is there any varicose veins that we can actually see? So this will cause malfunctioning valves. And previous injuries to the leg, so like breaks, fractures, um, and which you know can then impair walking, so you're not getting that, that venous return, the veins can be damaged through this. 
any surgery to the leg, such as, um, you know, have they had um, plastic surgery, flap surgery, which can cause damage to, um, to the veins, lymphatics, the ankle mobility, um, and their gait, so their, what, their, the way that they actually walk. Um, so if you, when you're doing the assessment, if you get asked somebody if they can actually flex their ankles or, you know, are they fixed and struggling to, to move them. Increasing age, we, we've said that, you know, we know our skin changes with age and some people just find it harder to move around when they get older. Not everybody, of course, there are some quite fit 80, 90 year olds out there, I'm sure. Um, but um, particularly if people stuff, start to suffer with arthritis, it can make it um, um, tricky and painful. Chronic edema, so that's associated with the inflammatory processes and compromises the skin overall and then the tissue condition. A really important aspect of um, leg ulceration assessment is looking at the patient's pain and, and remember pain is what the patient tells us it is and if somebody can't verbalise, you know, there are um, non-verbal um, signs um, that somebody can be in pain too. So pain is associated with all types of leg ulceration and, you know, it was always a past belief that pain was just associated with arterial ulcers and that's kind of what we, we 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 did the assessment on but i'm sure patients with venous leg ulcers will tell you they are extremely painful it's just the nature of the pain um, and because of the causation is different so a patient with arterial in, um, disease um, if they've got blockages in their arteries and as that blood flow tries to get through um, for example if they're walking upstairs walking up a hill is a classic example my granddad always used to say when we used to go on holiday to Scarborough it's far too hilly and because he had claudication in his legs and it used to cause a lot of pain also in bed at night they, they don't like to have their legs up and they want to dangle them out because it relieves it a bit with venous leg ulcers, the legs are described as being heavy and achy, and then the wounds themselves can be can sting and be sore. We also must look at the social and psychological factors um, for patients with leg ulcers. So what about their, you know, the, the leg ulcer and, and if you're in pain and you've got a wound with all these, um, you know, that's leaking, etc. There may be odour. You can make somebody feel really, really low in mood. So this can lead to a lack of motivation within their, 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 their the, the care, the care planning. Um, isolation, if they, they, they're not wanting to go out in bandages and or they're just struggling to, to mobilise because of the leg ulcer. They can become anxious then, you know, what about infection, what's going to happen? Some people are afraid of um, having amputations because in the past they saw, you know, grandparents and things when they didn't have the treatments like what we have today um, and suffered and went through. So then this can lead to um, loneliness um, and then they're not wanting to eat so well. And we know nutrition is such an important aspect of wound healing because we lose a lot through the extra day in proteins and electrolytes. And so we need to be looking at a nutritional plan. Um, the, you know, the, the social stigma as well. So, you know, leg ulcers don't just occur in one population, culture or anything else. They can occur, um, you know, from people from a young age and they, you know, it, and, and men as well. So they, they have this real um, kind of psychological um, kind of body complex image issues with that too. So that can then affect compliance and concordance with treatment pathways that we've put in place. So that's why it's important to look at self-supported management programmes. We get the psychological dependence as well. So I've seen um, in my uh, district nursing tissue viability community career, patients who are very isolated and alone. And then as soon as we get to healing, you know, obviously, you know, this doesn't happen for everybody, but certainly I've seen it in some patients where we call it knitting needle syndrome, where people actually cause self-harm to their wounds because they, they, you are their contact of going in weekly or more than once a week to um, to manage, apply their bandages, they have a chat and everything else. So let's um, look out for, for that and explore the psychological issues there. Um, sometimes it's just ignorance, lack of education. So we need to be providing that. Um, and also poverty, you know, people um, may not be able to afford prescriptions, um, um, you know, looking after their own care of nutrition, etc. And, you know, maybe the types of 
housing and um, they're living in um, you know many many environmental type type issues so let's look at a venous leg ulcer itself so we've got a lovely photograph there for typical venous leg ulcer so these are usually shallow um, in the tissue um, they have flat margins um, the sizes can vary so we can get small ones but they can be absolutely right round the whole of that mid gaiter the, the mid area of the leg they often develop more slowly so they can without treatment they will grow and grow and grow um, i've seen patients who've had them weeks months years before they've been referred into the right systems to get assessment and treatment they can have pain without clinical infection we know that's a, a you know a kind of sign of that but they will be painful anyway have we said and often um their legs are relieved by um, the compression itself because it, it's it's aiding the venous return which is an important part of if you're struggling with with concordance to have that discussion yes the compression you know is going to feel a little bit tight for a while but this is going to make it better and um, also that limb elevation too so part of the assessment we've done all the visual assessments etc so we we must do a doppler assessment so um, we want to be doing um, where we can a full lower limb assessment, including Doppler, um, as, as early as possible. So Doppler assessment can include the manual handheld Doppler like we see there. So we take the, um, the brachial um, artery um, pulses and we pump it up till it disappears and then we release the sphygmometer and then we take down we note down at the point on the on the dial when that pulse sound comes back in i like a handheld doppler because we can listen um, to the sounds of the pulses and there we have it with the ankle brachial um, area there so we're looking at the, um, the the pulses on the on the feet too so the pedal pulses are there as follows. So we do that um, dorsalis pedis. I always start at the, the point just between the, the big toe and the second toe there. And you can just kind of move and wiggle it down a bit until you, you can um, hear and find a pulse. And also um, there's the um, anterior tibial, perineal or posterior tibial. Um, I always go for dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial unless I can't hear it. And then I might um, attempt and try the others and you'll have your your ways of doing this i'm sure so the ankle brachial pressure index ranges are there as follows so we have a normal reading not with and this is remember arterial blood flow that we are measuring so 0.8 to 1.3 um, is absolutely normal and we are safe to apply our full therapeutic compression don't go low because you'll never go high so we need to be looking at that full compression here um, above 1.3 it may be just due to, due to you know the um, the doppler on the day it may be though that somebody's got calcification of their arteries typical in people who are diabetic um, and it may be just that somebody's got a lot of edema or lymphedema so it makes it harder to hear those pulse sounds so there are two different size probes so if you use the um, 0.5 probe then you can have a better sound and one tip I always use is I plug my headphones into the Doppler kit and you can hear the sound so much better that way too. ABPI between 0.5 and 0.8 so we're looking at some element of arterial disease here it may be that there's a mixed disease of venous and arterial so consider if it's too high or if it's in the lower ranges referring to um, your specialist whether that's in your leg ulcer clinics your tissue viability services and um, possibly your vascular centers as well um, and if it, it may be that they these patients can have compression i would apply compression in this case but i would um, apply a reduced uh, compression system if it's below 0.5 we're looking at critical ischemia or severe arterial disease so we want to do um, an urgent referral to vascular and not apply compression unless the vascular services advise you to do so so doppler waveforms we've got three so we've got triphasic which is a three beat and that is a normal healthy waveform and some of your doppler machines might show you the waveform too 
we have a biphasic sound so that's a two beat and then we have a monophasic sound so this is unhealthy um, it means the arteries have some element of a blocking hardening and the blood is struggling um, to flow through there so we can actually have a listen to those waveform sounds now so the first one is triphasic The second one is biphasic and then the third one is monophasic. So can you hear the difference in the beat between those three sounds? So now we're going to look at the wound assessment framework um, that we know is times. It's an excellent framework to follow for any type of wound assessment, not just um, leg ulcers. So the T of times is looking at that wound bed. So it's the overall appearance of the wound bed. What is the tissue like? Is it granulation? Is there some slough there? Is it necrotic, etc. Um, so the slough in, in, in there provides an ideal environment for bacterial growth because they love that moist warm area. So if that's present we need to be looking at um, debridement of that. We know the body tries to autolytic debride wounds. We, you can use dressings like hydrogels, um, you know, um, um, that real moist environment to get rid of slough too because it aids autolysis. Um, and also um, I like to use a mechanical debridement using things like monofilament um, pads in that cleansing process too so whatever is your local policy pathway and on formulary um, to do that so the removal of any dead cells that are there will will help with that healing process so the eyes for infections so all wounds all chronic wounds contain some microorganisms um, so but in you know that that left and untreated that bacteria will peripherate and it will cause wound infection and um, we've got a picture there of a lovely bright green pseudomonas infection to that leg um, and it may be that the wound infection is is localized so we look at that international wound infection continuum and we work from that so we want to be um, looking at um, our, our treatments so there's prophylactic type treatments there's um, antimicrobial dressing treatments um, and if the wound becomes a spreading infection then we need to be looking at swabbing to indicate what type of antibiotics we may need um, because we, we have an antimicrobial steward and we don't want to be over prescribing antibiotics so um, so wound healing can be affected by uh, biofilm too and um, which can be um, you know invisible we're just learning lots more around biofilms but that mechanical type debridement prior to applying our dressings and compression is a really good process the M is for moisture and moisture balance is essential in all wound healing, but we've got to get the balance right. Um, so we know wounds healing in a moist environment and sometimes we add moisture by using things like hydrocolloid dressings. But in venous leg ulcers, often we find a lot of excessive um, uh, exudate. So we want to control because some um, excessive um, levels of proteases can be in there and have an effect on wound healing so um, so we're going to be then looking at our super absorbent pads and yes we can apply those under compression um, and if the wound isn't managed properly then the the surrounding skin that peri wound area can become like this uh, wound in the photograph here very very macerated and can cause that type of venous eczema and further breakdown to occur too so the E is for the edge. So the edge of the wound can tell us a lot about how the wound is likely to heal. If a wound edge is rolled over and there's any undermining there, then that's unhealthy. And those epithelial cells cannot migrate and the wound edges contract together. If there's any suspicions... Um, in the wound so if you think in this wound is um, I've seen quite a few recently on lower legs of ladies um, where they um, I always call them sometimes a bit fruity because they uh, the leg uh, the, the wounds themselves because they're quite raised um, very quite vascular they might heal and then break down again um, 
and it may be that there's some malignancy there so we need to refer to dermatology for biopsy in these cases and despite everything so if the wound fails to respond, despite all the evidence-based treatment regime that we've put in place and the dressings, the compression, the cleansing, everything, um, then the patient should be referred on to your specialist services, so whether that's your leg ulcer clinics, tissue viability nurses, etc. Because there may be something else underlying there. There are complexities within venous disease too. So um, in MDT, multidisciplinary working, obviously is very, very important. Um, um, for us to utilize. So the last section of the TIMES framework is the um, surrounding skin. Um, so we can see on this photograph here, um, we've got um, a before and after picture of a foot and leg that is covered in um, hyperkeratosis. There's some quite thick plaques there as well. So this is um, with a skincare regime using washing, emollients and uh, a monofilament pad. Then um, this um, the skin is much more viable there and so less prone to cracking, infection um, and fungal infection around the toes getting in. So when we've um, done our full assessment, so we've gone through everything, including our ABPI, um, and just a note on ABPI, because I'm sure some people will want to ask the question about using automated Dopplers. In my trust, we have both, um, and it depends on what you use within your local area and just follow your local pathways and policies. So we're not going to go through whole management plans because today we were just talking about wound assessment um, we can discuss that at a further um, time in the future. Um, but just a brief overview around um, the, the, your treatment plans that you would put in place. So you would discuss and fully explain to the patient the diagnosis that you have made. Is it on a um, mixed disease, venous or arterial, um, you know, or other things going on? Um, and importantly, I haven't said this yet, but offer a referral to vascular services. And this is part of the National Wound Care Strategy sequin for lower limb assessment that at the minute has been suspended, but will be coming to us hopefully in the next quarter of, um, of this year. And it's important is this because patients can, you know, have duplex scanning and it may be that they can have corrective surgery. They may be, you know, there's been the EVRA trial about about this and there's the, um, you know, ablation um, type surgery as well. So this can be um, a re real big um, thing in prevention of recurrence. So we, we must be offering um, this to our patients. We want to make realistic goals and aims with the patient and remember your goal may be very different to your patient's goal. We need to put a care pathway into place with a treatment plan and um, keeping them at the heart of it. Um, and we want to um, um, look at suitable compression types that the patient can work with um, and that you know are the right things for them. Remember, you know, hosiery kits, wraps, bandages we've got lots of things out there for us decide on the choice of dressing we're going to apply to the wound and that important skin care pathway in place so the cleansing um, emollients etc so work with the patient or carer it may be that you can put into place some supported self-management um, joy's last um, watch party was all around that so if you want to watch that again to see um, hints and tips of, of how to do that and if it's appropriate to do so and then we want to give as much information as we can so that might be in the form of leaflets videos um, legal passports and um, that's what i use um, and patient diaries too um, and the national wound care strategy website has um, lots of um, information can be downloaded um, to, to use so that's the end of my presentation so i want to thank you all so much for being with me here this evening for this watch party and i hope you found it really useful um, you know i could talk forever on this subject and there will be lots of questions and maybe things that you know you thought of that i've missed out but i'm going to be staying around to answer questions for another 15 to 20 minutes so there is still time for us to chat 
Um, I want to thank Flynn Health for this evening's session for supporting this. You know, it's amazing that we can do this. It's absolute pure education. So thank you so much. And if you want to find out more about Flaminil and how that works, um, which is something which is on my formula room, we use extensively in all wound types. Um, so you, you can see evidence on the safety and effectiveness of that. So you can visit um, the, um, the, their website to do so. So as I mentioned earlier, Flen have a number of hand hygiene tools to give away to nurses who might find them helpful. So if you want to get hold of one of these, and I do, um, you just need to go to the website address on the screen now, which we will also share with you in the comments too. So once again, thank you so much for watching and everybody have a great evening. If you found tonight's presentation useful, then why not join me in a few weeks' time for a follow-up watch party on Legolson Management, which will cover referral processes, all types of compression and dressing choices. Don't forget I am going to be staying around for a bit longer this evening to answer your questions, so please do keep them coming in.